Welcome uh, to this event uh, entitled Developing Computational Skills uh, for Digital Collections, a new programming historian series. Uh, we're going to showcase the results of a recent project, which was a partnership between the programming historian, the National Archives and JISC, and was made possible by generous funding from both TNA and JISC, uh, for which we were and are very thankful. My name is Peter Webster of Webster Research and Consulting, and it was fell to me to be project manager for the project and your chair for today. Uh, for those uh, with visual impairments, I'm in my mid to late 40s, uh, wearing glasses, uh, mostly gray hair and a beard uh, that's uh, following suit. And I'm wearing a uh, sort of a, a light colored check shirt. The project then has developed a set of tu new tutorial articles uh, to be delivered as part of the programming historian, exemplifying best practice approaches to the interrogation of digital collections. And they have a specific focus on large scale and born digital content. The project aims to help address a noticeable skills deficit among researchers in the analysis and use of these kinds of digital collections held by cultural institutions. And we expect the first of these, uh, and there'll be seven in all, uh, to be published in the next few weeks. Our aims today, though, are threefold. The first is to introduce the project that gave rise to the series. Our second is to uh, present three of the forthcoming tutorials of themselves. And finally, to, to have a chance to reflect a little on the project itself, on the challenges of creating training materials of this nature and its implications for the future. So, uh, without any further ado then, I move straight on to the first part of our, of our, of our session, which is a reflection on the aims of the project from the two organisations uh, that commissioned it. We're going to hear from Paola Marcioni, who is Head of Product, Content and Discovery at JISC. But first, uh, we'll hear from Joe Pugh, who is Digital Development Manager at the National Archives. Uh, Joe, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. So, uh, hi, I'm Joe Pugh. I'm, as Pete said, I'm D Digital Development Manager at the National Archives. I'm a um, dweeby looking brunette in glasses. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, very briefly, I wanted to just tackle the question of what, you know, kind of why we're doing this. So I work in the Archives Tech Development team. I'm the person responsible for um, producing the National Archives Digital Capacity Building Strategy, um, plugged in, powered up. And in the in the research phase for that, when we were speaking to archives, we found that they had a uh, they had a digital problem both at the supply uh, level and the demand level. So when we're thinking about digital collections um, uh, and uh, digital preservation, there's an issue about what archives are receiving. So that the, the pipeline from their parent organisations is often um, uh, rather fragmented or, or blocked they have they have trouble receiving um, the records that they need and they it's very challenging looking after them but they also have a demand problem and that is to say there are not many people knocking on their doors saying tell us about your really exciting digital collections we want to use them and because they have this demand problem that makes it more challenging for them to solve the supply problem it's very difficult for them to lobby to have more digital preservation capacity because they can't demonstrate an audience need. So we were interested, you know, we, we, we put a lot of resource into solving this supply problem, or, uh, you know, we, we've commissioned, we're working with the Digital Preservation Coalition, for example, on um, novice to know how, you know, a, uh, you know a, a set of tutorials aimed at archivists in order to help them increase their digital skills. But I was also very interested in, sol in solving this demand problem or doing something about it. Now, obviously, an intervention like this is not going to magically <laughs> transform uh, humanities researchers. But I, I was very interested in what was the most effective um, thing that we could do on a limited time scale and budget. And I think that there wasn't any doubt in my mind that it was working with the programming historian that was going to maximize the impact of whatever we did because I think the programming historian is absolutely one of the most um, outstanding uh, digital humanities resources that I've seen produced over the last 20 years. I, you know, it's it's something that I would use myself, which I wouldn't, and, and, and indeed have done, which I, I can't with hand on heart say about every interesting looking digital humanities project. It, you know, it 
it, it clearly fulfills a genuine use and it has done for me. It's made me a better programmer. I wish it had made me a better historian too, but you can't have everything. Um, the, 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 the strength of the platform for us was partly that there was an audience there already. You know, as far as I was concerned, it was the place to, to put these things. We weren't going to have to worry about building that audience later, which is often an afterthought with these things anyway. And have you got the, the, the time and the money and the effort and the energy to, to actually do that? Um, it's, it's also that I, I feel very strongly that the content on the program historian is pitched at just the right level. So, it, you know, the, the amount of handholding involved is neither too much nor too little. And it genuinely takes you right through the process of, of doing these things such that if you're unfamiliar with them, you're, you're able to, um, uh, you know, get, get, get the thing built and um, adapt it for your own um, research need in many cases. Um, and I also think that the, um, you know, the quality of what's there is so high. And so one of the things that we did in the course of this was very much to kind of stand back. So I talked to Paula and other colleagues will say a bit more about this, but um, the Programming Historian is a, is a peer review platform. So having decided what our broad area of interest was, that obviously we were interested in increasing um, use of digital collections and we wanted to have a call that was going to focus um, on that, we very much stood back and said, you know, let um, uh, let this process work itself out. It would be very inappropriate of us to um, get involved in a peer review process. And the, the high quality of the content that's there makes us very, very confident that the resources that are going to be produced are going to be of, uh, uh, that, that they're going to fulfill the, um, the need that we set out at the beginning, that they're going to be of high quality and that they're going to be um, of use and useful. And indeed, <laughs> you're, you're going to hear about um, uh, uh, from at least uh, one of the speakers later on a resource where I'm like, I will probably be using that myself uh, within the next few months as soon as it goes live. So um, that, that, that's, that's the rationale. I don't, want to, I don't want to take you through the details of our strategy. Uh, it's not, not, not trivially interesting, but that's the, um, that, 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 that's the through line of why we thought it was important to carry out this work and why we thought the Programme Historian was, was absolutely the right partner to, 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 um, to conduct it with. And I'll, 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 I'll pass over now. Thanks very much. And, and thanks to everybody who's worked on this project, particularly Peter, who's an amazing project manager. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Paula, do you want to, uh, do you want to uh, uh, come in next here? Yes, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Peter and Joe. Um, my name is Paola Marchionni. I work at JISC. I'm a head of uh, product in a team called Content and Discovery. Um, for those of you who appreciate um, a little visual clue, I am in my 50s, I've got short kind of pixie um, bleached blonde or white hair, depending on when you see me. Um, I wear glasses and I've got a, a, a black uh, a sleeveless blouse. Um, so apologies if I reiterate a little bit about what Joe said um, in terms of our reflections and the reasons why we were so keen to be part of this project. Um, I guess that shows good alignment, but um, for those of you who don't know, not too familiar with JISC, um, JISC is the UK uh, digital data and technology agency um, for the tertiary sector. We work, and in my team, we work uh, primarily on uh, um, uh, higher education, uh, but we cover further education and skills, research, and innovation. And um, in content and discovery, we've for years, and traditionally JISC has done um, a huge amount of work uh, to promote the creation, the use, interrogation of digital collections. So we focus very much on um, data sets that come from libraries, special collections, archives. Um, and also within our research and innovation uh, strategy, um, there is very uh, much an emphasis on, uh, on uh, around the deployment, the use, the reuse of all type of assets that make up the research a state and uh, we see content and collections in particular in the digital form being very much part of that um, and as Joe has uh, pointed to and we've heard a lot in this conference and certainly this is something we hear a lot when I and colleagues uh, speak to uh, our HE uh, members both in terms of the libraries and the practitioners and the scholars um, and the archives that there is 
this gap really between the, the huge amount of content that is now available. Of course, it's never enough. There's, there's more that we can digitize and we can make available. Um, but the, uh, so we, we, between that and the level of skills that now are needed to interrogate and to make the most of that, of that content, I've heard more than once the, the, the expression about the, the DH long tail, so the digital humanities long tail. There's a lot of um, uh, practitioners and scholars out there who might not necessarily call themselves digital humanists, but are having to uh, deal with data sets uh, in their uh, historical and humanities um, uh, scholarship uh, workflow. So, uh, so this whole area around the skills um, was very, very important to us. Um, and when we started talking to uh, the National Archives and to Joe about what potential interventions we could make, uh, I think after a half an hour conversation, we, it was very obvious that the programming historians was one of our key stakeholders, rather than us trying to get together and create new resources ourselves. Um, it, again, it, it became very obvious that uh, we should speak and work with those at the core face of it those who are already, um, uh, so whose job it is to, um, uh, to, to support skills development. Uh, and we really liked their approach, the fact that it really works as, a, uh, as an open access peer journal, as, uh, as um, Joe uh, referred to. And I really personally liked the international um, ambition and, and breadth and, and scope, uh, the fact that articles are translated into uh, uh, different languages. So I've only got praises for um, for the team. So I'm just going to um, to end with thanking uh, James Baker and Adam Krimble, who were the the, the, the first uh, uh, contacts at, at programming historians, uh, but of course the whole team, the authors, uh, and and Peter Webster, who has just said has been an excellent uh, project manager. So. I'm looking forward to hearing um, from, from the actual people who've done the work. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paola. Thank you, Joe. Uh, you've set us up perfectly uh, for the session this morning. Um, what we have next then are uh, short presentations of three of the seven uh, tutorial articles that make up this project. Um, the, uh, before we plunge into them, just a reminder that do please add your questions uh, to the Q&A function, including uh, things that may already have occurred to you in relation to what Joe and Paolo have had to say. Uh, but our first uh, presentation uh, of the tutorial, that is to say, uh, has, has two authors. Um, uh, John Reeds is Associate Professor of Spa Spatial D Data Science at the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis at University College London. And, and we'll hear first from Jenny Williams, uh, who is a doctoral researcher in the same centre at, at UCL. Uh, and their title today is uh, Comparing Automated Document Classification Using Word Embeddings to Expert Assigned Duodecimal Classifications. So, uh, it, uh, Jenny, uh, if you'd like to, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, as Peter said, uh, my name's Jenny Williams. Um, I'm five foot tall, have fair hair, I wear glasses, and I'm in my late 50s. Um, and I'm wearing a white top. Um, and yes, I am a PhD student in CASA at UCL, and my research is in collaboration with the British Library. Um, I'm using an e-thesis online repository containing more than half a million PhD theses from covering over the last 100 years um, in the UK. Uh, I can't possibly read them all, and so I'm using natural language processing to try to identify communities of what we're calling early innovative activity. Um, and we're looking to reveal what researchers are actually writing about uh, using the title and abstracts of their theses. Thank you. Over to John. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm John. I, I am down to my last linen shirt based on the weather uh, that we've been having this past week. Uh, so I, I'm in black to contrast with Jenny. Uh, I also have glasses, but nowhere near as uh, dramatic and cool as hers. So uh, I'm six foot two blonde. Um, and I will get started now with the presentation. Um, so 
I, uh, you know, my experience doing research has been that the best way to really learn how something works is to try and teach it. And one of the things that I've been wanting to do is to really understand um, what Jenny's been doing. And so I took the opportunity to write a tutorial for the programming historian to kind of, you know, in, in a sense, enrich my own understanding of Jenny's work. Now, what we hope to achieve with this tutorial, which I'm kind of giving a high level overview of, is two things. Um, one is to briefly explain how natural language processing and in particular word embeddings open up new ways of engaging with archives. And the second way was to test kind of how that approach measures up against the expertise of the human on document classification tasks. So one thing I want to be really clear about is we see this as sort of the kind of thing that might augment existing practice. I, I hope no one comes away thinking that we're under any delusions that our approach can kind of somehow replace the expertise of you know, librarians and archivists. So as Jenny mentioned, our research makes use of the British Library's eThesis Online or Ethos data set. Technically it's metadata because it stores data about theses, things like the title, the author, date of submission, et cetera. So the vast majority of doctoral theses have metadata uh, records in Ethos. Um, the first is in Latin from about 1812. Um, the data quality, as you might imagine, varies widely um, because obviously Ethos has not been a resource since 1812. So some universities have been going back and entering lots of, if you will, old data into the British Library's data store. Um, other ones uh, have not been quite so uh, progressive. The main way that most people would interact with this is through this web interface. I have a screenshot of actually my PhD thesis up there, um, but you can also download the data in bulk. And that's what we've been working with. Um, so ethos has already been used for sort of manual keyword and topic selection. Um, people have used it to look into kind of novel chemical compounds, post-colonial relationships between supervisors and their students and career progression and dementia research. But we're kind of interested in engaging with it rather than sort of selecting small subsets, actually engaging with the corpus as a whole. And so if we want to do things like categorize dissertations, things get a lot trickier because there are clear, there's clear evidence of changing practices in the completeness measures that are shown on the screen. Um, as a reminder, uh, though, the DDC, which stands for duodecimal classification, um, is fairly consistent throughout. So that's kind of become our, our, our baseline reference point. So the nice thing about the DDC um, is that it's a kind of expert label. So that's a, you know, expert label is a term of art from machine learning where it's part of the training process. So for instance, Google's image search uh, and street view platforms didn't spontaneously learn how to recognize, you know, different types of birds or crosswalks. You know, they were trained by experts, which is to say, if you filled in one of those image-based captures to verify that you're a human being, then you were in a sense, part of that army of experts. So. Uh, we selected four disciplines using the DDC that we thought would present a range of challenges for an automated approach. Um, so what we'd be looking to see is, um, you know, bearing in mind the DDC itself is, of course, is not perfect. We'd be looking for a fairly good alignment between kind of what we, how we classify things in an automated fashion and how experts classify things kind of one at a time. So our sample is 48,000 uh, records and that was fed into the pipeline. What is a pipeline? Well, so it's three stages of data processing, cleaning, um, learning and analysis. In the cleaning stage, we're looking to standardize documents um, so that, that, that we want to then process further. In the learning stage, the computer learns, and I mean that in a statistical sense, about the corpus. And in the analysis phase, we take what the computer has learned and convert that back into kind of types of insight that we humans can you know, comprehend and benefit from. So I'm going to briefly talk through these on the slides uh, and then go back to illustrate kind of what those outputs look like. So the purpose of the cleaning stage is really to radically reduce the overall vocabulary by standardizing word forms, finding meaningful kind of turns of phrase, and stripping out high and low frequency words. I'm happy to talk through any of those things in more detail in the Q&A. Um, then we move on to the learning phase, and that's really driven by the learning of context. And to a computer, context means the words that surround a particular target. So in a historical corpus, we might see, for example, you know, Queen X ruled for 25 years, King Y ruled for four years. And from this, the computer would 
you know, begin to see that queen and king are used in similar contexts, and therefore there's some kind of relationship. And across a large corpus, we might also find that she is used in the context of queens and he in the context of kings. So um, using this kind of that, that the idea that was put forth by Firth uh, back in 1957, that, you know, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, the computer uses uh, a process called word embeddings to ensure that those kind of those kind of contextual relationships are preserved. And it was really word embeddings that were the breakthrough in about 20, well, it was published in 2013, that has led to kind of the rapid advances in natural language processing over the past decade. Um, but even word embeddings are still too much in their raw form for the kinds of analysis that we want to do. So we use a technique called UMAP to reduce the dimensionality, which kind of distills the information down still further. And after that, we can cluster the documents and finally try to measure how well we did. So now I just want to show you kind of what that process looks like. So this is kind of how it works. Now let's see what it looks like. So here, um, this table shows uh, three randomly selected documents or bits of three randomly selected documents before and after cleaning to give you a sense of how this works. So you can see things like capitalization, punctuation, and to a lesser extent, sort of plurals and tenses have gone um, together with high and low frequency words such as, you know, a and the and so on. You'll also see some underscores, and that's where the computer has found statistical associations between pairs or triplets of words across multiple documents. So then the word and what the word embedding process does is to convert that raw text or that clean text rather into a vector. So that's a, a row of data. And in this case, it's a row of 100. Each each word is converted to a row of 100 numbers. Um, uh, that vector embedding is the technical term is done using something called a neural network. And what the what that process does is try to ensure that words that are used in similar contexts end up with similar numeric representations. So here again are some examples. So on the left side, we have a term taken from the corpus. The next three columns are the first three of the 100 dimensions that we calculated using the word embedding algorithm. So there's 97 more columns of numbers, which I'm not going to show for obvious reasons. These numbers don't mean anything to us, but they do mean something to the computer. And finally, on the right hand side, we see terms that are near, meaning they have similar embeddings to the term on the left hand side. So, you know, this is scientific data, so or sci these scientific records. So accelerator is near to terms like beam, CERN, and other things having to do with, for instance, high energy physics, while National Health Service is unsurprisingly near to NHS, public sector, and public health. So we have given the computer no guidance as to how to determine these relationships. We haven't given it any hints. And this is just what is emerging from the context in which each word is being used. And then um, it's a bit mind bending, but it actually turns out that we can take the vectors for each of those words in a document, average them together and get a useful representation of the document. So then each document can be represented by a you know, 100 column vector. And now we still can't plot or understand that. So we can use UMAP here to project those 100 dimensions down to just two, which is what the visualization here shows. So each of those dots represents a document colored according to its original DDC uh, classification. So the documents are for the most part well separated by DDC. So that's a really promising sign, but there's so much data here that it's almost hard to make sense of what's going on. And you might already be picking up on the idea that there are some social sciences over in the, over in the sciences at the top level. And obviously some economists are thinking, yes, we're over with science, uh, um, uh, with biology and physics on, on the right-hand side. Um, so another way to represent kind of the performance of our work is this confusion matrix. If every document was assigned to a cluster that matched with one DDC exactly, we'd only have numbers on the diagonal. So those are the bold numbers. Anything that's not in bold um, is a case of our process and the librarian having a, you know, a difference of opinion. So on the whole, at the top level, we're about 98% accurate. The next level down, we're 90% accurate. Those off diagonals, if you know, we might assume they're a mistake because it's not how the expert classified it, but it's worth asking if a human under any number of kind of practical pressures and constraints is, is always going to get things right. 
I certainly wouldn't be the person to tell you which subdivision of physics or medieval literature a text was most appropriate for. So here we're just looking at word clouds, which is standard technique covered in another programming historian tutorial to pull out keywords from the misclassified documents. And what's clear from looking at these uh, two examples is that it's entirely debatable whether the computer is in a sense wrong. So the 42 physics PhDs um, that are clustered with the social sciences look a lot more like the interests of social science. We have economics looking at the natural environment, identity, energy generation. So I think this is kind of pointing to the really interesting potential for computers to augment a classification process, not to replace it. Um, so kind of wrapping up fairly quickly, where do we see this kind of approach being useful to you know, collections and communities? Obviously, born digital archives, you know, in our discussions with the BL about text mining, um, you know, they've talked about issues around, you know, they're being increasingly supplied with, for instance, personal hard drives as part of a bequest. Um, I don't know about any of you, but the thought of somebody trying to make sense of my backup drives is, is, is quite terrifying. Um, you know, also these more structured documents. And so these sorts of techniques can be applied to any corpus, um, and we don't necessarily need to use that DDC. That's more, you know, we happen to have a data set where we can kind of test and show the show the utility. But in principle, they they offer ways to browse, uh, you know, a corpus that's evolving over time, uh, where we don't have a sense of what kind of structure is in there, and give us ways to kind of find natural groupings, at least from the computer standpoint within that corpus. And I think I might be over, so I should probably um, I should probably wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I mean, as it happens, you have another minute or two if there's something particular you want to add. But if not, we'll move on. Uh, well, so I just one one last thing that I think is just really exciting. There's um, there was some research done uh, recently using this same technique, but in a more specialized way, uh, looking at material science, where they found that. Um, they were actually able to anticipate uh, discoveries in material sciences by, by kind of two to three years by finding associations, again, in this case, between terms that would then be picked up later as a, a, as a discovery. So obviously the payoff in the physical sciences of getting like a year ahead of other labs could be enormous. But I think, you know, it also opens up more collaborative ways of sort of peering into the future to understand the evolution of a discipline like you know, geography or, or or anything else. So, and that's really kind of where we link back to the sorts of things that um, Jenny's doing in her really exciting uh, PhD. Thank you ever so much, John. Thank you, John, and thank you for uh, and Jenny, in, as it were, in the background of that of that, of that and indeed the foreground of that presentation. That's um, it, it's fascinating. I can see all sorts of applications, not least in my own my own work, for which I'm grateful. But, um, um, if you have questions uh, for John and Jenny, do please put them in the question and answer session and we will pick them up as we as we go on uh, a little bit later. Uh, but now we move on to the second of our presentations, uh, which is uh, from uh, Shahan vidal Goren, who is uh, president and founder of CALFA, uh, which specializes in text detection and automated analysis technologies for manuscripts in oriental languages. And he is also a doctoral student as well as a teacher in digital humanities at L'Ecole Nationale des Chartes in Paris. Uh, the title for today is uh, AI for Automated Transcription of Historical Documents. And so Shahan, if I can ask you to share your slides, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, thank you very much for the organizers for this round table and uh, for the invitation to present the, the lesson I have made for programming historian. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank all the GIST and programming historian team for their work, help, and uh, assistance for to write the lesson. Uh, indeed, my presentation will focus on something quite well known. Um, I think automatic transcription of historical documents uh, that is a key step in any digital humanities project and can is access to collections in digital libraries. Um, but my presentation will especially be focused on under-resourced collections, uh, under-resourced languages, etc., because uh, the problem is quite different from common languages. And uh, what I have tried to highlight in my tutorial for programming historian is key things to have in mind to create AI model for such documents, uh, basically what are the good practices. So. 
everybody here know everything about uh, OCR and HDR, I think, so nothing to say about that. Thanks to AI, it's very easy to reach uh, very good accuracy, uh, very good uh, recognition rates when you can provide big databases uh, to train your system or when you focus on specialized models instead of generic models. And for instance, we have very good models for Latin and medieval French uh, at the Ecole Nationale des Chartes. And basically, uh, the common pipeline with such a deep learning approach is uh, when you are not satisfied by the results, uh, we generally say, OK, it, it doesn't work. Uh, we should add more data. And if it still doesn't work, OK, uh, we should add more data um, and so on and so on. And this pipeline is simply not sustainable when dealing with under-resourced uh, cases uh, because language specificity, because a lack of specialists to annotate documents, uh, because existing databases are not relevant uh, for your problem, uh, because you have very specific specifications, because you have a lack of materials, etc., lack of time um, to transcribe manually documents, etc. So the reason, in fact, is quite simple, how uh, OCR and HTR works. Basically, uh, a good recognition system has to identify in a document region of interest. So it's the first step of the layout uh, analysis. And in my example here, in green, it is a main text, in red, marginal areas, and in blue, tables. If it is accurate, then the system will detect inside these regions uh, the lines. And after detection of lines, uh, one model will recognize the text. And sometimes uh, the recognition is assisted by a language model. And, um, and that's it. So this pipeline is very efficient uh, for common script and layouts. And as you can see, for each step, we have, we have to create dedicated models. So, a model for the layout analysis and a model for line detection, a model for text recognition, and sometimes a model uh, for um, bringing some context with language information. So at least three models. And it already takes a lot of time to bring and uh, annotate enough data for one model. So three models, it's simply not so simple uh, for different cases. So some examples of situations for which uh, we are in a number of resource cases uh, because of the scan, scan quality or state of conservation. Here it is a microfilm in the left uh, because of the complex layout. So even if it is a printed document in the middle, the complex layout is um, difficult to overcome or also uh, because we have a mix of marginalia and the main text uh, in the two examples of, of the right with Greek and uh, Arabic scripts. So uh, for each situation, uh, we will have to create dedicated model to reach a good recognition rate. For that, uh, we have some platforms uh, to help researchers and institutions to create data, to train new models. And uh, you certainly know Transcribus and uh, Escriptorium in particular. Um, but um, as I said, for a lot of cases, and in particular for some languages and scripts, uh, we face to a lack of data or even a lack of specialists. And uh, generally, these platforms require a significant amount of data to be accurate with new kind of documents. Um, and generally, uh, they also require knowledge in machine learning. And another problem is state-of-the-art architectures are highly designed for Latin scripts, uh, recognizing basically characters in documents. But when you are working with Arabic documents or uh, very cursive scripts, you would prefer to recognize words in instead of characters. And intuitively, it's, it will be more accurate and um, generally it is. And finally, um, creating data. In fact, uh, what does it mean? And maybe it's, uh, it's the main question for, for such a task. Um, to create relevant models, um, we have to define a very precise set of specifications. What do I need? Uh, what do I want as an output? Uh, for which purpose? 
um, do I want to do a critical edition of my manuscripts? So I will do a diplomatic transcription, or um, I want to allow keyword search in the digital library. So I will try to read all the abbreviated words in my manuscript, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's the main uh, the main problem to overcome. So on this example, I have trained a very accurate model. So uh, when I say very accurate, there is absolutely no mistake in the transcription. So the character error rate is 0%. But uh, even if you don't read Armenian, uh, you understand um, well that we have some problems. Columns are not detected. So we have a, an uniform block of text. Uh, words are not separated. Uh, abbreviations are not read, etc. So basically, even if I have a very good recognition model, uh, the text is completely unusable, so it's not accurate. So uh, my tutorial, my lesson was is focused on defining needs for a transcription project. Um, my case study is a Patrologia uh, Graecae, uh, in which we have to manage a complex layout and very poor quality of uh, printed documents. And I have chosen this document because I think it's maybe more readable for everybody than uh, Armenian or Arabic uh, manuscripts. Uh, but in fact, the problem is absolutely uh, the same. So um, the problem of the quality of a print of these printed documents leads to a, a very high level of ambiguity for the recognition of characters or recognition of words. And so we will have to do some choices in the Unicode transcription. Uh, we will, for instance, not try to detect all the diacritics independently, uh, but we, we need to recognize each different combi combination of each character. And uh, also in my example, we only need to uh, recognize and to detect the red colon and uh, not the blue one and the green one, etc. So we will have two things to do, create a specialized model uh, to detect uh, the Greek uh, text and a specialized recognition model to overcome uh, these uh, difficulties. And another difficulty uh, here is uh, curved lines. So we will have to, to deal uh, with uh, curved lines. So uh, we will choose a baseline approach uh, that allow us to follow um, the curvation the curved line, and to uh, extract the line with polygons instead of uh, bonding blocks. So the lesson used uh, the Calsa Vision platform that is quite similar to the other platforms uh, I have mentioned, but uh, this platform includes in particular in a real-time AI fine tuning that means generic models available online on, in this platform are automatically specialized on your specifications during the progress of the projects. Basically, we just have to proofread automatic analysis to let the model fine tune themselves uh, on your task. And uh, on top of that, the platform use neural archi architectures uh, more designed for under-resourced cases um, it doesn't rely on a single approach, uh, but with a specific specialized approach for each kind of uh, documents or scripts. And what uh, we observe with a very small amount of um, data, only 10 pages, uh, character error rate is around uh, 5%. So that means for 100 characters, only five are uh, wrong, uh, basically. And the detection of Greek regions um, is also uh, relevant after Trent images uh, proofread. After 10 images, it was approximately 85% uh, of uh, good, uh, good accuracy, of a good FN score, but um, I spare you the details. Um, and the Latin script is quite, quite, um, quite good. But uh, not so, but uh, because we are only interested by Greek, it, it doesn't matter, in fact. And the recognition, the detection of the line, you can see is uh, almost 100%. So, uh, so we can move forward very quickly to transcribe uh, these documents of the Patrologia uh, Graeca. So basically, that means on the platform, we have uh, generic models 
that has been trained with oriental documents, with printed doc documents, handwritten documents, archive, old manuscripts, etc., different languages. And these models are specialized according to your specifications. So it's basically what we call uh, fine tuning. And so this is the results uh, we reach uh, at the end of the tutorial. So uh, in yellow, you have the mistakes. And you can see even if the character is not well printed or because the quality of the scan is not very accurate, etc., cetera, um, the recognition of the main text is, main text is uh, well, uh, well done. And basically, the, 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 the next step will be to add some data um, on top of these 10 pages in order to maybe have a character rate less than uh, 4% or 3%. But if you intend to do some keyword search uh, in such a document, this accuracy is already enough. So to summarize a bit, uh, to overcome difficulties raised by um, under resource documents, uh, fine-tuning is one of the key of the success. Um, if we are able to define uh, precise needs. It is generally not a good idea to begin to create data for creating data because it will force to create more data, a huge amount of data uh, with, without being sure to reach a very good model uh, at the end. So we have seen that we can reach a satisfying model with a very, very limited data set. 10 images, it's um, nothing in deep learning. And it's the conclusion of the tutorial, in fact, um, defining a very good set of specifications to define needs and uh, create an AI model. But basically, this kind of approaches open new perspectives for under resource collections in digital libraries. And uh, data generated for these lessons are available on GitHub and model available online. So thank you for your attention. Some references to highlight, to highlight uh, what I said in different scenarios with Armenian manuscript, Georgian manuscript, Arabic manuscripts, and also to manage uh, Latin abbreviations or different um, set of specifications to see what, is, um, what, is, what, what can we do uh, with uh, such a thing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Shahan, for that, which is fascinating and uh, uh, looks to be a, a really, really very important uh, piece of, of equipment as all in the in the scholarly toolkit, as it were. Um, do please, uh, everyone, uh, if you have questions uh, for Shahan or for anyone else that's spoken already, do please add those to the, que the question and answer function. Uh, the third of our three presentations of uh, our specific uh, sets of the new tutorials uh, is from Jan Ryan, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the University of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, the title is uh, Building Interactive Applications with R and Shiny. So Jan, if you want to uh, share your slides, the, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so, Okay, you should all be able to see the slides now. Uh, hello, yeah, so um, my name is Jan Ryan and um, uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki. Um, to give you an idea of what I look like, I have sort of medium-ish um, brown hair and I am clean shaven. Uh, I'm 37 and I'm wearing a, a plain white shirt. Um, so uh, this is my uh, presentation, um, uh, building interactive applications with R and Shiny. So just to give you a little bit of background about um, where the sort of the tutorial came out of. So it was, as has been explained, as a response to the, the JISC National Archives and Programming Historian called Computational Analysis Skills for Large Scale Humanities Data. Um, and so I developed a tutorial called Building Interactive Applications with R and Shiny, uh, which is currently in the final stages of review on the Pro Programming Historian website. And, hopefully will be published uh, on the website uh, fairly fairly shortly. So in, in this presentation, I am going to uh, just talk a little bit about why I think it's a useful skill for humanists working with large scale data to have. And um, then I will just talk a little bit about the technology behind the, um, the tutorial, uh, Shiny, 
uh, give a, a very brief kind of walkthrough of the tutorial itself. And then uh, if there's time at the end, just very kind of briefly reflect on some of the challenges around making a, a tutorial with this kind of content. So um, uh, first of all, why uh, why do I think it's uh, useful to have these kind of, or to teach these interactive um, uh, application skills? Uh, so interactive ele elements or user interfaces uh, can make scholarly outputs more accessible and readable. <clears throat> Uh, they can be particularly useful to share uh, large-scale humanities data, uh, and, and this is partially because it kind of allows us to switch between these broad and focused views, which is always kind of a difficult um, uh, thing to do when, when working with um, and communicating results from uh, large-scale uh, large -scale data. Uh, it can also help to communicate uncertainties or ambiguity, ambiguities in, in, in data by allowing the, the user to sort of um, um uh, sort of uh, gather their own kind of pers perspective on on the on, on on the on the on the data um or or re research results that are being shared and, and we see that more and more uh, research outputs uh, include interactive elements of some kind um and a uh, an inter it's sort of an intermediate language um, which i'll explain in, in a little bit uh, like shiny uh, makes these these kind of interactive interactives relatively easy to produce and this was kind of the motivation behind creating the tutorial was to to uh, to to teach this skill, which is sort of relatively easy to pick up, um, and and allows uh, users to make interactive applications or visualizations. So to kind of give a couple of examples of the kind of things that I'm talking about. Um, so uh, lots of people would be familiar with the sort of interactive visualizations found in data, in data journalism that have been kind of quite common for some time. And here I'm showing a sort of animated GIF of a uh, interactive visualization from a website called The Pudding. Uh, I think it's a um, uh, analysis of of, uh, of, of Spotify um, uh, uh, data. Uh, but uh, more and more, we're finding that uh, sort of more kind of traditional scholarly outputs are including interactive um, visualizations or, or applications. Um, and uh, this this next um, uh, slide has got a a kind of an uh, animated GIF of a website called Tudor Networks of Power, which allows you users to uh, browse through and explore the Tudor state papers. And to give a couple of examples specifically using uh, Shiny, uh, this is a um, interactive application uh, built by some researchers at the University of Utrecht uh, to browse through some certain elements of uh, historical newspaper data. And uh, another way to use Shiny is to actually embed uh, the applications into project websites. Uh, so uh, the example here is a, from a project called Mapping the Gay Guides, uh, which embedded a, a map of their results uh, within the project website itself. Uh, and so just to sort of uh, briefly give an overview of what Shiny is, uh, so it's a package. So a, a package is like a sort of set of functions or commands uh, with a particular purpose uh, made for a programming language. And uh, Shiny is a, a package for the programming language R, um, which can be used to create interactive applications. Uh, and so the, the basic sort of uh, Shiny uh, application has got a couple of components. It has a user interface. Uh, so this contains the visual inputs and sliders and uh, buttons and so forth, uh, and also contains the output. So the outputs of whatever code happens in the background. Um, and uh, the second component is a server, uh, which contains the backend code for the application itself. And so uh, usually what happens in a Shiny application, a user will adjust some sort of sliders or toggles in a, on a web page. Uh, the server listens for changes to these, um, to these sliders or inputs and updates and displays uh, whatever sort of relevant uh, outputs are desired by the, by the application. And so the, the, the benefits of working with this, so one very important one is that it works with a, an existing popular coding language, R. Um, so R is a very kind of general purpose coding language, and it allows you to um, use all of the various functions of that of that coding language, but make them interactive um, in a relatively easy kind of way. Uh, it's it's free to use and it's open source, although you do need to host the app somewhere, which generally can cost money unless you're just using it for sort of personal use. Uh, and what I found is it's very good for making sort of prototypes or exploratory apps, uh, or for making in, in internal tools um, within within a sort of a, a research project. Uh, does have some draw drawbacks. So it's uh, 
you need to have some knowledge of the programming language behind it are and um, so it's uh, it's not sort of possible to learn without knowing some of that um, and it's sort of fairly restricted so you sort of won't be able to build sort of um, very artistic or, or creative um, uh, interactive visualizations that you might see in, uh, which require more sort of customizable uh, javascript or something like that and as i said the hosting usually costs money as well um, so to move on to a very kind of short uh, uh, preview of the of the lesson itself. Um, so the the users or the, the readers will learn how to create a, a very basic shiny application. Um, and they'll be walked through the basic principles of, of what's known as reactive programming, and and they'll sort of learn how to uh, work with the basic construction of a shiny web page user interface. Um, but it doesn't teach you how to publish the application to the web or or sort of basic coding with R. Uh, other than what is just about necessary to, to make the application itself. So um, to give you a, an overview of, of, uh, of Shiny, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a couple of main elements. There's the user interface, and this is where the visual appearance of the app itself is stored. Uh, and then it's got the server component, which contains all the code and the logic, um, which will be used in the application itself. And then the third uh, element is uh, a command within the programming language to run the application. And once you once you sort of put all these three into a particular type of script, uh, run the command, uh, then the application will will run in in a, in a web browser and um, uh, can be can be sort of run locally and tested. And so to go into slightly more detail about these. Uh, uh, various components. The user interface is sort of like basic building block of, uh, of a Shiny application, and it's built around a grid system of rows and columns, um, and it allows for customizable layouts. Uh, so one typical example and the one that's used in the tutorial is a sidebar layout, um, which contains a main panel and then a side panel, which contains things like user controls. And you can see here that uh, it's built by nesting a number of, of commands within each other uh, which then correspond to the various uh, parts of the web page, which you will afterwards populate with things like sliders or maps or whatever it is that the application is going to do. <clears throat> uh, and these these controls themselves are known as uh, widgets, and uh, they kind of form the the user in, in, input for most shiny applications. And these are sort of interactive elements like sliders, selectors, and so forth. Uh, I've given a couple of examples of them here, uh, which allow the application to be controlled or various options to be ticked or, or selected and so forth. Um, and to give you an example, so this is one we use in the uh, in the tutorial itself. This is a slider input widget. So as you can see, it's just a slider with two ends which you can drag and it uh, updates a couple of values underneath. Um, and uh, these are the values that you'll use to, to make changes to the, um, to, the, to the code and the eventual output. Um, and so the example use case used in, in the tutorial itself. Um, so I, uh, I use a data set of metadata um, for all British and Irish newspapers held by the British Library. It's uh, about 30,000 uh, titles or so. And this data set can be used uh, to chart the growth of the press over time, understand the library collection practices, and perhaps we can use it to sort of uh, help around shape, share, shape our understanding of things like industrialization, demographics, and so forth. And so this is a freely available um, um, public domain data set available on the British Library Open Research Repository. And so the, 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 the question that we're looking at in the tutorial itself is to look at the change in the growth of the press over time and, and the, specifically its, its geography. And this went from uh, 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 industry that was based mostly in capital cities to something that was regional and then uh, eventually a local uh, newspaper industry um, over the space of, of 400 years. And the tutorial walks through creating an interactive map and um, allowing the user to explore these changes. And so the, the uh, tutorial itself has got three coding steps. Uh, first, you, the, the users will create a very simple user interface. Then they'll create a reactive data set of places, um, <clears throat> which contains a count of the appearances in the data, as well as their geographic coordinates. Uh, and then uh, this will be used to create an interactive map using another R library called Leaflet. 
Um, so the first step is to create a user interface. Um, so we add this sidebar layout to the, user, to the UI component of the application. And this creates an empty website, and then we put the various inputs and outputs into this. Um, so you can see again here, the, here is the basic layout of the, um, of, of the application, the sidebar panel and the main panel. Uh, the second uh, step is to create a reactive element. So a reactive element is a, a special type of object um, uh, within R which listens for changes to a related input. Um, so in this case, it would be the start and the end date that we've picked with the slider. And then it, if any time it finds a, a, a change, it detects a change, it reruns the relevant code. Um, so in this example, the reactive element is going to be a dynamic data set of newspaper counts. Uh, so you can see as I change the slider here, um, the count of newspapers updates itself in this kind of mini data set um, on the right hand side. Um, and so this reactive data set is then can be used for other purposes, so passed to other R code or passages uh, or packages. And for this uh, for this tutorial and for this application, we use the leaflet package, uh, which is a kind of a, a very useful. A uh, well developed package for R, which uh, allows you to create interactive maps. Um, and so, again, now if we update the slider, uh, you can see that the uh, map updates a number of uh, points on the this interactive map underneath. Um, and it's got some very basic interactivity of zooming and hovering over places. Um, but it's quite easy to add additional information to that. Uh, and that's uh, sort of the, the basic steps of making the tutorial. Um, there are lots of other uses for Shiny, so it's not just about making visualizations, but it's you can make quite uh, complicated applications, uh, quizzes, um, uh, and, and write to persistent storage, uh, and even make slideshows. So it, there was some interactivity in this slideshow, which was made with Shiny. Um, and uh, so the benefits I sort of mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'll just briefly talk about the challenges because I'm guessing I'm almost out of time. Um, so some of the things I've been had to sort of uh, grapple with while making the tutorial. Um, readers are more likely to have some coding skills, so li less likely to be starting from scratch. And um, so pitching the lesson at the right level is, is, is something at, uh, of a challenge and giving enough information about the underlying coding language R without um, uh, without, without spending too much time uh, teaching the very basics. Um, in, in, in general, things like this with, with interactives, which are reliant on live code, there are more issues and challenges around hosting and preservation in comparison to something that has a static output. Um, as they rely on live code, there is more likely to be compatibility issues as time goes on. Um, and uh, it's also the case that tutorial sites um, naturally are built around um, uh static screenshots and and code um, and so there's less of an in infrastructure there at the moment for teaching interactive elements in this way um, and uh yeah so that's the end of my presentation thank you very much for listening and and also thank you very much to the organizers of the conference but also to just national archives and the programming historian and um, and everybody that's been involved in the project and in reviewing and uh, editing my tutorial itself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jan, for uh, another uh, fascinating presentation of what's going to be an important uh, resource. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, 20 minutes or so for, for questions. Um, we have, there are a couple in, oh no, sorry, there are now more than a couple, in fact, in, in, in the chat. Um, and I, but I, I, can I, before I plunge into those, can I invite the rest of the panelists to switch their um, cameras on if they're happy to, and then if they have questions or comments that they want to contribute, they can they can wave their hands at me, and we'll, we'll go on from there. Um, the first question, then, actually, let's go. Um, uh, let, let's start. Let's start off with in fact. For the first one is for Jan, and this is from from, from Becky Scott. Um, is a question about what, what are the pros and cons that you see of learning R as opposed to learning, say, Python? What, what are the what are the advantages and disadvantages you can see there? Uh, I think this is the eternal question, but uh, I, I I mean I think it's just whichever one you um, it works well for you. I mean there. There, there are sort of probably some lists of things which are better on one and better on the other. Um, I, 
I, I like R because it has this um, very widely used um, IDE, so the, the the kind of standard interface that many people use um, is, is quite easy to work with. And if you're coming from a non-programming or non-command line background, it was much more of a kind of a gentle introduction. Uh, so I like that. I know that Python is better for some things for sure for machine learning and um, um, yes, yeah, so it is the state of the art um, uh, AI stuff. Um, Python is kind of the, the much more popular one. Um, but uh, another thing is that you can actually, so I, you, you can use both of them at the same time. So that's, uh, there's, there's ways now of, uh, of combining R and Python code in, in the same scripts, um, which I do sometimes. Um, so you don't necessarily, just because you learn one doesn't mean that you can't use some of the functions or skills from the other one um, if you need to. Thank you very much indeed. Um, actually, what we're, there's one, we're actually here, I think I think it's a question, well, a question from Isabel Holowati, which I think is for both Jan and Chahan, um, which is about preservation and sustainability of, 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 of these projects we're talking about. To what extent are these applications, uh, tools and outputs future-proof? I don't know, Jan, do you want to start and then I'll come to Chahan with that? Yeah, yeah, that's it's a good question. and. Um... I think it, it is it is a problem, um, particularly because these are sort of interactive tools and 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 they rely on um, uh, on on live code. Uh, I mean, the something like Shiny does have a, a benefit over maybe less kind of open source um, in interactive applications in that the, yeah, so the, the code is open source and it's it's possible to sort of create a environment within R, which means that um, you you can kind of, you can sort of recreate exactly the conditions where the application was made in the first place. And um, so it does, using something like like Shiny um, and, and R has some advantages over maybe more kind of bespoke interactive visualizations. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult, uh, it's, it's uh, it's not that easy to preserve them, which you know, is obviously particularly important for research outputs. So they, they sort of live on um, some sort of live uh, hosting site. And if that goes down or somebody stops paying for it, the application might stop working. And um, so it's it's a it's a interesting challenge. And I think it's one that um, uh, libraries and so forth will probably have to think about more as time goes on and as people create more and more of these kind of interactive applications, which are becoming relatively easy to, to produce and becoming more likely to, to be part of research outputs. Thanks, Jan. Chahan, do you want to jump in on that as well? What does, what does sustainability of this look like to you? Yeah, uh, in, in fact, thank you for the question. In fact, um, because of the evolution of AI, these tools are forced to evolve also in the future. Um, but the main issue to easily is access to this collection is uh, the amount of data required and approaches are already sustainable. They have been adopted by all teams and tools uh, now. Uh, data formats are completely interoperable. So it is clear that for OCR and HTR, uh, we have defined a lot of things uh, that are sustainable. But I think the, the most important thing here is not really the sustainability of tools, but the availability uh, of uh, data. Uh, once you have annotated um, your documents, uh, then you can use them to try new models, even if uh, technologies uh, have changed. Uh, but the sustainability of the model itself Yes, of course, you will always find uh, uh, new developments that uh, leads to a non-useful model. But if you can keep and can store the data with a full description of uh, the specification of your data set, well, the, the sustainability is, um, is here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, We've got a couple of questions for uh, John and Jenny. Uh, the first that came in is from, from uh, just T. Pool, uh, um, uh, which is, if this were to be used in a catalogue search context, uh, do you foresee any issues with word embedding making searches that are too broad for the, for, the, for the average user? In other words, are they likely to be deluged with thousands of potentially 
relevant results. John, I think you were going to take that one. Uh, no, I think I'm going to answer that one. Oh, okay. Um, Fire away. Yeah. Um, well, I haven't really used it in a catalog search context, but I'm guess I'm figuring that that's really a user interface decision, depending on what you actually want the users of your archive to achieve when they get their results. Um, and you could use the interface to kind of prompt them to include additional keywords. You could combine it with a keyword search, or you could supply them with additional documents that are related uh, in similar terms using these embeddings. So you could use a combination of things and you can constrain the um, word embedding uh, discovery documents um, by saying, I only want to see a hundred, or you can look at the distances uh, between the documents. Because the whole thing about the word embeddings is that it makes everything mathematical. And so you can then use the similarity between documents to say, well, these ones are really close and these ones are further, further away, depending on how much stuff you want to give back to the user. And one of the advantages of this over keyword searches is that keyword searches miss documents um, in research uh, when, the same, when the same word isn't present in the other paper. And that kind of doesn't help with things that were done years ago that might be in the same context, but they don't use exactly the same language. Um, so yeah, you know, they they kind of enhance each other, but the word embeddings are much more contextual than just using keyword document searches. But at the same time, if you constrain everything, you can say what how far you want to look or how close or combine two together in a catalog search context. Thank you, Jenny. John, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, I think just, uh, I mean, actually, because Jenny just brought in the element of time. So this speaks to the other question in the Q&A about, um, you know, change over time and, 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 and the kind of impact that might have. Um, I mean, that is an area, it's not an area that we're actively working on, but it's an area that certainly within the digital humanities, I, I know, um, you know, Barbara McGilvray, who's at King's, has done work on this. Um, uh, you know, how word embeddings change over time. And it, it makes sense that you can pick up this kind of thing because essentially the context in which a word is used changes. Um, I, you know, it, it's uh, so, 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 and therefore the embedding will change. Now, what you need is a way to kind of say, you know, before and after, or, 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 or kind of some way of separating those two time periods, but it's not impossible. They're also more sophisticated you know, the, the area in which we do our work has progressed a lot beyond word embeddings into kind of there's, um, you know, especially driven by kind of Google and, and Facebook, where the same word can get different embeddings based on being used in different contexts. So for instance, word embeddings cannot distinguish between, you know, the, the, the simpler version that we've used can't distinguish between a bank as in a financial institution and the side of a river. Um, but the benefit that we get is we can run this approach on a laptop. So, you know, Jenny's been crunching the data for the entire, uh, the entire ethos data set on, a, you know, just a modern laptop, whereas we need something a lot more powerful to, you know, to, to, to get those, those more subtle embeddings. So the answer is, is yes, it can be done. Um, it, it wasn't our particular research interest. So right now we're being kind of ahistorical, but the data we're working from is from 1980 onwards anyway. So, and during that time, there's been change, but not the kind of change you would see between, you know, uh, theses written in, you know, 1912 and, and 2012, for instance. Uh, can I follow that with a question of my own, which is actually to convert a point that was made in the chat into a comment stroke question, which is actually, um, it's actually whether, so we've talked a little bit about, about the idea of quote unquote misclassification in, in all of this, which of course is, is and, and you don't for a moment, really suppose I think that that that, 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 that you, don't, you don't give it the kind of pejorative sense that that word might mean um could you expand a little bit on on, on that sense is actually kind of where is you know is the interest here actually in in the quote-unquote misclassification to an extent yeah so so I think that there, there's a couple of things that are really interesting about this um I mean one one is as and and I, I believe it was Andrew's point is of course that um 
an archivist is taking in contextual uh, information that sits in outside of the text, right? So for instance, a PhD coming from Imperial is very unlikely to be say classified as social science, even if it's say uh, educational, you know, physics in education, um, simply because the context is Imperial as a science institution, not a social science one, speaking very generically. Um, I think what, you know, thinking a little bit about you know, and expanding on what Jenny was saying is this idea that you could use it as a prompt to say this document looks like this. Um, you could also think that it's a way of approaching interdisciplinary text. So here's one where it's kind of expert classification and it's textual classification differ. These ones, you know, may deserve more attention or that might point to, a, for instance, an, an emerging area of research, um, that sort of thing where you get those overlaps. I, I think those are kind of points of real interest that sit don't sit neatly within their kind of disciplinary boundaries they, they misbehave and are therefore misclassified but and as i said in the in the chat i i mean that in a technical sense not a you know a fundamental truth of there is one true you know correct classification for a document thank you very much um can i follow can I, um do folks do please i keep adding more questions as they occur to you and, and i uh and the panel if they want to wave their hands and we can also jump in um but john is you know could could what would be the next could this be made even more quote unquote accurate is there is there more refinement you could put into this that, that, that or actually are, is, are you really working with you're working with third party uh technologies and applications which which, which kind of limit you know, you, you get what you get in this sense, or is there another step that is, could it be improved, if that's the right word? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'd like to let Jenny speak to the technical improvements that are, met, met, you know, many. Um, I, I think in this sense, what one of the things that we would like to see happening in, in our discussions with kind of the ethos team at the British Library is one of the reasons that they're interested in this is, can we start to close the site? Because, you know, they have, for instance, lots of documents that have no classification information, can we feed back? Well, here's at least a high level classification that could help improve you know, the structure and, and retrieval of documents and things like that. So there are ways to even now begin to feed that back. Everything that we've done um, is open source and in Python and eventually, we'll, well, obviously it'll be on the programming story and tutorial website, um, but you know, even the full work is in Python. But in terms of technical improvements, I'd like to turn that back to Jenny and let her speak to kind of more specific things that can be done. Yeah, I mean, in terms in terms of the word embeddings, they've gone from very simple um, simple things where you have a huge matrix of vocabulary and you say, oh, this word is in this document and this word is in this document, to being to then moving on to contextual um, word embeddings, which we've talked about, um, where the context of words is is kind of calculated within the corpus that you put into the programming like so you if you don't put everything in the world in then if you only choose like a subset you're only you're getting the context within that subset so now there are embeddings called BERT embeddings in particular which are the latest um embeddings and you know they're very complicated to code it, it's not it's not very straightforward. Most of this has been, we've used uh, Python libraries and fought and battled to get them to work. The, the stuff that we presented to you is the stuff that works really well, but there is other stuff that's more complicated that takes a long time just to get to work. And, you know, it's all changing every year. Something new comes out that's better than the last one. So yeah, it is, it's, it's really evolving all the time and trying to keep up with technology as much as anything else. That's our biggest kind of challenge. Um, and we did, we did do quite a bit of work on phrases um, as well, trying to capture new, well, new phrases, old phrases, any phrases really across time. Um, so yeah, that's another area that people, people are moving in on, but it really is a case of you have to keep up with the technology all the time and yeah, to get it to be useful, more and more useful. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. Um, I see James uh, Baker is, is waving his hand. I should introduce James, uh, but before I do, um, 
Uh, there's still a question in the chat from Isabel Holowati. I, I think John picked up on some of that, but Isabel, if you want to kind of refine and rephrase that and post it again, if there's something more specific you want to, to dwell on that, well, that would be great. But uh, James, James, who we're going to hear from uh, in a minute, is uh, is uh, part of the core programming historian team. James, you, you, you fire away. Yeah, and I'll probably introduce myself in a minute when I come in a minute properly. Um, I just want to quickly go from the conversation about simplicity to kind of some of the things Shahan talked about. And Jahan, I recall in, in your, your application when you um, submitted to our call for papers, you talked about things like minimal computing and, your, and you talked a bit today about kind of the value of small. And I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on like what you think methodologically, particularly when you're kind of teaching an approach or even just applying it in research, the kind of the value of starting small with kind of simple AI processes that can be run on local laptops, as opposed to going straight for the sort of the, the brute force approaches that are kind of more common in, um, in, in some areas of computing. I think your, your article is a really great exemplification of some of those those values sorry that's that's for me is that <laughs> it was for shahan oh sorry sorry i misheard i apologize oh, but please <laughs> because I, I agree with you but i'm not sure to to, to, to understand everything so um uh, in fact co concerning uh, the amount uh, and the working with few 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 things and few data set indeed it's important in the future to to work uh, with uh, a few amount of data, but not only for OCR and HDR, but actually it's the main problem of deep learning. Uh, you bring a huge amount of data and you hope everything will work with this huge amount of data. If it doesn't work, you will have to bring new more data. And at the end, uh, you will not know if uh, this neural network has learned something or if you have uh, provide um, too much examples, and so it's something like by heart uh, is not learning something, but is just doing exactly the same that he has seen in training. So it's one of the of the key step in the future for for deep learning. I completely completely agree with that, and um, in my opinion, for HTR and OCR in particular. Um, one of the key key things for overcome overcoming this uh, this thing is to work with spe specialized, um, dedicated architectures for specific languages. I mean, um, it's a nonsense to to work at the character level, for instance, when you are working with a very cursive script or Arabic documents, because there is no character, in fact, to to recognize. So, if you are working with the word level or with the sentence level, it's more accurate because a human is doing something like that when you are reading Arabic, etc. So yes, creating more uh, this more customized architecture will be um, the key step to overcome the amount of data in the in the future. Yeah. Or another instance for if you are working with Chinese, uh, you have something like um, 30,000 different uh, characters to recognize. And if you rely on a massive approach, you have to provide 100 or 1000 um, um, samples of each character so it's not possible with such a, with such an alphabet so yes we have to think about other approaches thank you uh, very much uh, shahan i think uh, we, we're getting close to to the end of this this session i think if there are, i don't see any more questions coming in so in which case what i will do is i'll move straight on to our final uh, presentation uh, which is given by uh, James Baker, uh, who you've heard from already, who is Director of Digital Humanities at the University of Southampton, but also part of the, the core programming historian team. This is an opportunity to reflect on, on, on the project as a whole from the programming historian end of it, or as we've already heard from the JISC and the TNA perspective. Uh, James, you don't have any slides, I don't think, but uh, so over the floor is yours. Yeah, I don't have any slides because actually I was constructing what I wanted to talk about really while I was hearing um, about these really wonderful papers um, and thinking about how they came to fruition and how they've gone through our processes and and how um, now they are very close to publication. We can think about what have been the implications of the, having these kind of things um, as part of the programming historian. So yeah, I, I'm James. Um, I've been the programming historian team since about 2017. I'm a trustee of the programming historian's charity. And in my late 30s, white skin, blonde hair, gradually inevitably receding, um, black room glasses, mostly smiling with a blurred background. And I don't know the color of my t-shirt because I'm rather colorblind slash deficient. Um, maybe it's gray, maybe it's blue, not really sure. Um, and it's lovely to be at DCDC again and lovely to see so many familiar faces in the chat. Um, 
as a little bit of framing for going to the reflections, this is the first project of this kind the program historian has been involved with since its founding in 2018, that is actively working with, with funders and supporters. Um, and this particular project on developing computational skills for work with large scale collections started in August with a call for papers, we did some selections in the autumn, and then we the submissions came in around January and all these articles are now on their, on their pipeline to, to publication. As many as you will know, and you'll have seen today, the historian bit in program historian is rather broad, as are our audiences. So we have about 1.5 million readers per year um, from people in Indian cities known for the tech sectors, often looking for Python tutorials to glam sector colleagues who are running peer learning workshops or code cafes to rapidly expanding communities of readers in Portuguese and Spanish speaking South America as we've diversified into, into those languages, which I'll come to. Um, and, and based on that kind of tradition and the kind of who we are as a project, I really have kind of three main reflections on how this project has kind of maybe think about what we do, our model of being the programming historian and how we work and how that might shift or change. The first of these relates to um, Isabel's question on sustainability. So we clearly as a publication been around since 2018. 2008 um, have a challenge associated with articles on large data sets because they often need to interact with data services rather than they do with data sets. We have been burnt before on this by um, an article that relied on an endpoint from a large institution that we thought we could trust that where that endpoint went offline and the sustainability thresholds that we've built since then in response to that means we choose to be careful with both the data and the kind of code that are used in articles that are proposed to us and I should mention of course I'm, I don't mean sustainability in a climate crisis sense here but we do care about that as well and our static build is low resource intensive both for um, our creation of it but also for um, the users of our articles and I think that's that's a really important part of our architecture. So we had to tread really carefully, basically, in this project and selected articles at the corporate paper stage that use services like Ethos we've seen or Archivo.pt, which is the Portuguese um, language web archive that we hope we can trust. And I think that that's been really important for me that we've kind of managed to retain some of that um, sustainability in how we work. The second um, reflection, I, main reflection I have relates to something Shahan said. Um, that we should not become a code book that is just attached to computation. We should not go with that drift towards those kind of big, large things, services like Google Colab. We believe there is really a role for us in a space increasingly dominated by ephemeral code books attached to cloud computing. Um, before this particular project um, landed, um, my favorite article that kind of exemplified this is, is Zoe Saldana's um, article from 2018 on sentiment analysis for exploratory um, data analysis, which you can find if you go to our um, lesson um, archive and, and type in Zoe or Saldana or sentiment or something like that. Um, you can easily run the code in this full article length piece in five minutes. But the real value of that article um, is in the analysis of the outputs and the discussion of those outputs that kind of prompts the reader to reflect and consider what it is that's happening during the course of this sentiment analysis. And I kind of wondered before we kicked off this project whether the articles that we got would sort of drift us more towards being a kind of a code book model with thin description pull it, holding it together rather than having a kind of slightly more focused on method, I guess. Um, but the authors, I think, have really demonstrated that tutorials and the analysis of large data can take the form of tutorial length articles that entangle kind of reflexive methodology with getting stuff done. And, you know, if you're someone who comes to us and just want to get stuff done, you can kind of skip through, cut the bits of code out and kind of just like get things moving. But if you want to really think about the underlying technologies and how they're interacting with the data which these articles are using and the methods used by the author, um, I think that remains very valuable. And we still, broadly speaking, as you've seen today, have uh, an ethos that's around people submitting things to us that things that they have done as opposed to things they want to show other people how to do and I think that's that for me remains a really valuable part of what we do and I hope these articles continue that well I know these articles will continue that tradition and it's interesting to me it hasn't sort of drifted us away from that. Finally the third of my main reflections is that I think the project has underscored um, by virtue of trying to produce these articles simultaneously. So we had a call for papers, uh, we then let our authors know, and they almost all um, submitted roughly around the same time um, in January this year. Um, it's really underscored to me the extent to which publication services 
um, that have things like peer review that we do, that do do copy editing, and that also like we do have translation work embedded in them, um, do take significant labor and time. And we often forget that I think in, in sort of open access and we can forget sometimes that things being produced are, are significant um, investments. And, and the reason I, I say that is because of course we've been working for a long time and publishing this model for a while and bringing in translations for the last sort of four or so, four or five years. But I think having lots of articles at the same time have really shown and exemplified the kind of that model because when you just have articles in rolling form you don't see that in that batch sense I guess um, the kind of the effort and the kind of the, the real time it takes to produce quality work um, and this is especially true as our as our, our peer review processes focus on article sustainability as I mentioned which really brings in a lot of different kind of elements in the peer review process um, but also that it's really focused on writing for global audiences um, in ways both that support the reader who is in, say, India, for example, who may not understand a particular kind of colloquialism from North America, um, but also that enables translation. And as I said, we are a multilingual publisher. Um, and in order to enable translation, we, in, we sort of, it, we encourage our writers to write in a certain way. And then we sort of edit those articles through peer review to kind of push them towards a more kind of global writing um, style. Um, Two of the articles published um, of, in this series are also published for the first time in a language other than English. And so we're doing this multilingually, not just starting with English, but starting with all the languages and trying to feed them so they can inter interlace with each other. And we currently publish um, in English, French, Spanish and, and Portuguese. So it's one of our, our challenges. Um, and indeed, one of the articles has been already been significantly localized during its translation with slight revisions to the way the data sets work and slight revisions to the way the kind of the case studies work. Um, so I think this model um, has, has, you know, is, is really powerful for us because localization can be incredibly important for um, communities to really kind of get to grips with with a particular article. Um, but just to kind of say that um, I think the investment, the time it takes is very different to kind of just publishing a code book ultimately. So before I hand back to Peter to um, with the final words of closure, I just want to thank our funders once again, JISC and TNA. I want to thank Joe and Paola in particular for their enthusiasm um, towards the programme historian, Peter Webster for his leadership, um, Tiago, who's also in the call today for, for holding everything together during the course of the project, um, to the authors for their hard work, to Peter Findlay from JISC, who I think is lurking on the call as well, um, for sort of sorting out the project setup phase, um, to all our institutional partners. We have over 30 paying institutional partners from across the world um, and you can even if you're a library person buy your subscription via just subscription manager now which is great and you know those supporters enable our work to happen um, and to all our trustees the team and the staff at the program is still really intervening as and when needed during the course of this project because a complex project like this does mean it even though you resource it and you allocate particular time to individuals it always spills a little bit around the sides into the wider team need to be involved so thank you to everyone for, for such a, a wonderful project that's produced i think some some really wonderful series well, really wonderful articles forming the part of this special series Thank you very much indeed, James. May I second uh, his thanks to, to that long list of, of people who've made this project what it is. Uh, can I thank everyone for joining us uh, today in this call? I hope that, hope that it's been uh, useful and enlightening. Um, I add, add my thanks also to the DCDC team who've made sure that everything is run so unobtrusively smoothly today. Um, do please look out for the new articles as they come available on programminghistorian.org. Uh, in the next few weeks or uh, and or follow the Twitter account with the handle uh, at proghist, P-R-O-G-H-I-S-T. And it just remi remains for me to thank uh, finally all of our speakers for their uh, uh, admirable timekeeping uh, clarity and, uh, and for the, it, such interesting presentations. Thank you very much indeed.